two, one, two. Okay, good evening. Right, so we're just a little bit past the top of the hour, but uh, if you would turn to Romans uh, chapter 3. In just a minute, I'm going to have uh, Brother Dewberry open us up in prayer. But, uh, but this evening's uh, chapter 3, I think I got some good stuff prepared for us. And uh, we're going to start off with some uh, prayer requests. And I've made a, a list just to save a little bit of time. I know that uh, Martha Fair, need to continue to pray for her. Um, Candy spoke with her, so her is kind of, she's hanging in there. Okay, doing some post-op type stuff. And uh, can't forget Becky Cram, need to remember her. You know, fire off some cards to her, check on her. Especially this time of the year. Uh, Mike Barrow had his surgery, and uh, apparently it went well. They've had him up moving around a little bit, so that's certainly a good sign. Um, always want to remember Harold Collins. I think Rick said today's his birthday, right? So that's awesome. And uh, I know there's some others. I'll open up the floor in just a minute, but I'm going to ask that y'all pray for the congregation at Melrose. If you didn't know, Melrose is a little congregation just south of Keystone Heights, and it's east of Gainesville. It's about a 50-minute drive from this building, okay, north. And um, I preached there for a couple of years. The uh, preacher up there uh, reported to us, and Candy saw it also on Facebook, that a couple of weeks ago, COVID just swept through that congregation. And there's, it's a congregation of about 55 to 60 members. And it hit just about every family Varying degrees of illness, some severe, no deaths, but some severe, some minor with flu, but many tested positive who had the vaccines and the boosters, okay? Two weeks ago, the elders there decided to cancel service and they went remote and then last Sunday, they opened it up because they felt like everybody was kind of turning the corner. So something happened up there. Um, I've been in touch with uh, one of the elders up there and then the preacher who's also an elder, uh, Gene Morgan. Just the people up there are just absolutely fantastic. I just cannot even begin to tell you. It's so much, it's like a mini version of Central. That's how wonderful that congregation is. Just great people. And it just broke our hearts to hear about that. So please pray for that congregation. And just going into the holiday season, you know, and everything and Christmas and all, just, just be mindful that there's some stuff going on. People are returning from cruises, sick, stuff like that. A number of our brethren that attend Bible class with us on Wednesday night are sick. Uh, we have some out of town traveling, so we just want to pray for their safety. But um, there's, that stuff is still going around. And I know after the first of the year, they're going to start small groups. Honestly, Candy and I haven't decided how we're going to handle that yet. But anything else that we need to pray about? That's, that's a long list. Or any updates? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, Paula had a, a procedure, dermatology procedure, about a week ago, and then she got sick, and they passed it on to Mark, so we need to pray for them. John Arnett. Okay. We'll, we'll certainly be thinking about him, and he's your brother. All right, we will pray for him too. All right, George, you got all that, brother? Okay, you would uh, open us up.
Amen. Thank you very much. Okay, tonight, chapter 3, the key verses in chapter 3, and I usually start off with this. One of them has to do with our theme, which is grace. But tonight, we're going to focus on the righteousness of uh, God. But let's talk a little bit about uh, the righteousness of God revealed, that is. But uh, go to chapter 3, verses uh, 23 through 25. I'm going to read these three verses. And I'm in the New King James. Okay, verse 23, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We talked about this the first week we were together. That's one of the key verses, not only in this book, but something that we'd focus on here in this chapter, that all have sinned and fall short. And remember, the, uh, most of the book of the Romans is going to deal with the Jews and the Gentiles, uh, things that they're having to deal with, strife between them, and also uh, Paul's dissertation or lessons to both groups about salvation. Okay, uh, Jews talking, uh, bringing up the old law, and of course the Gentiles and how they're going to move forward too. But the key here is that regardless of what your background is, what your ideas or thoughts are, all have fallen short. We've all sinned. And it doesn't matter. Um, doesn't matter what your background, your faith, your belief that you've had in the past. You have to understand where you are and where you're heading, moving forward. Okay, and that's the key to the uh, next verse, verse 24. Being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, and we talked about. One of the themes of this book being grace, and that's certainly what it's all about right there. And then verse 25. This is huge. Whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance God had passed over the sins that were previously committed. So the blood of Jesus. And if you take a look at, and kind of tie Romans into the rest of Paul's epistles, you know, when you study the, um, the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, I know that you've probably read a book or sat through a Bible class or heard a, song, a sermon about the, um, the harmony of the Gospels, where they kind of talk about some of the things that are similar and parallel and some of the different views and ideas of the writers. What's interesting is that there's been a lot of study about Paul's letters, breaking them down, his different letters to the churches and his different thoughts and the different things they're dealing with. You can kind of throw Romans in there too. Paul's main goal is to let everyone know that grace is a free gift and that God's son, that blood, covers those past sins. And especially to an audience like the Jews that are living in Rome that have been so for so many years tied to the old law. But if you take a look at the, all of the epistles, you can see this harmony going on in the writing of Paul. And you can tie it right in with Romans 2. The focus about Christ, Christ crucified, Christ's blood, and that's huge. That, that affects us. That lets us know that, you know what, we're all sinners, but you know what, the difference between us and the world is that we're not any better. It's the fact that if we sin, our conscience bothers us. Paul talked about this in uh, Romans chapter 2. There's something about our heart that affects us when we sin and that we want to do better next time. We beg God to forgive us because we're Christians and we believe what that blood means and what it stands for. And we, can, we know we can go to the foot of the cross and we can beg forgiveness for our sins and try to do better next time. That's the difference between us and the world. It's not that we're any better. We don't need to judge, um, point the finger or anything like that. This is a little bit of a theme that you'll see in Romans too. But the bottom line is, we do the best we can as Christians. 
that's all we can do because we know we're going to make mistakes. We know we're going to falter, but we're always striving to do better. Now, I know that this is not scriptural, but we're coming up on January 1st, and I know the big thing that you'll hear a lot about will be New Year's resolutions. Well, the past couple of years, I think I've done a pretty good job of following the ones that I put on for myself. The one last year was to try to watch a whole lot less of football, and I've accomplished that. Candy will even tell you, okay? But you know, the interesting thing is, there was a, there, a couple of years ago, the New Year's resolution was that I was going to read the Bible every day. And the following year, I kind of slacked off on that. You know, we need to think about that. We need to think about as we're moving forward to try to do the best we can in that department. Try to maybe make that a goal this year that, you know what, and let's start it like right now. Let's not wait till January 1st. Let's start it right now. Try to be better next time. This is something Paul touches on. He says, you know what, you've all sinned, but you know what, you got the foot of the cross. Grace is there. God loves you. He sent his son to down the cross for you. Okay? As Christians, we're trying to do better next time, but we're also trying to grow too. We're trying to have this marked spiritual growth. Am I stronger now spiritually than I was a year ago? I mean, that's something we need to ask ourselves too as we kind of move forward through our Christian walk. But, uh, but this is huge. Anytime Paul focuses on the blood, that's a, bit, that's a very big deal because these are people that are living in that time. 2,000 years ago, I talked a little bit about the history. There's a lot of horrible things going on in Rome. Christians are being persecuted, okay? It's not an easy place to evangelize. The Romans hear you doing it, they're going to drag you out and kill you. That, that, they're not even going to think twice about it. We have freedoms and liberties here in this country that the New Testament Christians don't, certainly didn't have. We also need to think about that too as we kind of move forward into uh, the next year. Seeking opportunities to spread the gospel. Paul, I mean, this whole letter could have been totally different if the New Testament church started under an empire where the emperor was okay with Christians. Can you imagine the impact? Can you imagine the influence? But that's not the case. God chose that New Testament Christianity, that the New Testament church start under a horrible empire. And that's one of the things my mind is kind of wrapping about. So as we start to move on into moving out of chapter 3 and on into the future chapters, just kind of think about the book of Romans and the people that Paul's writing to. He's not writing to a specific church. We talked about this in chapter 1. He's writing to a group, and he'll mention them at the end of the book, chapters 14 and 15. He'll mention their names. Okay. Any questions or comments before we move forward? Any thoughts? In, a, in an aspect of discernment, not in, a, in judging in a way of discernment, not judging in a way of rendering some kind of sentence, correct? Discernment. Yes. Very good. There's an aspect there you need to think about, that discernment aspect. Remember we talked about it last week, praying for wisdom and praying for common sense and praying for understanding if we continue to do that, that's going to help us to be stronger Christians. That's going to help us to make decisions better in every aspect of our life. Praying for wisdom, common sense, and understanding. You know, God, I got a financial decision coming up. It's a big one. Can I have, I'm, I got to pray for the wisdom to make the right one. Will you guide me? God will help you. God will be there with you. About a job career some kind of a job change or promotion or um, a family member that you know is lost. 
what are the words that I could say to them? What, how, how, what is it that I could do to try to convert them? Pray for wisdom and guidance and understanding in doing that. Very good. That's going to help us. Yes, sir. Anybody else? Okay. So, so let's go uh, move forward. I'm going to talk tonight about the, uh, the righteousness of God revealed. Righteousness of God revealed. And I'm going to read, I know I already read these verses, but I'm going to start at 21. And I'm going to read through to the uh, end of the chapter. And we're going to focus just on this because I've got a lot of notes on it. Verse 21, and I'm in the New King James Version, chapter uh, 3 of Romans, verse 21. But now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe. For there is no difference, for all have sinned and fall short of the uh, glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation by His blood through faith to demonstrate His righteousness, because in His forbearance God had passed over the sins that were previously committed, to demonstrate at the present time His righteousness that He might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? No, but by of the law of faith. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. Or is he the, um, the God of the, of the Jews only? Is he not also the God of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also, since there is one God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. Do we then make void the law through faith? Certainly not. On the contrary, we establish the law. Okay, so let me just read a brief introduction. A major theme of the book of Romans, in addition to grace, is right is the righteousness of God. It is mentioned in connection with the gospel of Christ, Romans 16 and 17. We studied this the first week. It is the major subject of discussion in chapters 1 through 11 along with grace. The phrase righteousness of God can be understood in two ways. Anybody help us understand that? What are two ways that we could understand the righteousness of God? Tell me what you think about it. The righteousness of God. Tell me about God being a righteous God or God's righteousness. What do you think about it? Okay, yeah, he's exactly right. God's own personal righteousness is his justice. He is a fair judge, isn't he? He is he's one that's going to judge in the end, but you know what? He's fair. He's not partial. Okay, very good. God's system of making man righteous is by what? How's God making man righteous? Okay, by faith in what is occurring with, okay, the blood, okay, but then what's God doing? His grace, he's forgiving man of sin, exactly right. Faith in Christ, your obedience to what Christ did for us on the cross, okay, doing the things that God would have us to do regarding salvation, We've, and then, like Wayne said, that comes, you've got to have faith in God. That starts. Faith in God. You believe Jesus for who he says he is and what he did on the cross. You do what God commands regarding salvation. Okay? And then that grace that uh, he bestows upon us, 
That's granting forgive, uh, forgiving man of sin. Both concepts are addressed in the book of Romans, but the latter in particular in chapters 1 through 3. Paul describes man's need for righteousness, and we studied this, how the Gentiles are in need of salvation in chapter 1 and how the Jews are in need of salvation in chapter 2, concluding that all the world is guilty, even Israel who had the law, Romans 3, 19 through 20. That law doesn't matter because God's Son, God's Son and that blood is what watches us whiter than snow. And I've said this once, I'll say it again, you know what, there's not enough bulls, rams, or sheep for me to sacrifice for the sins I've committed. Can you imagine that? But thank goodness, thank goodness we're under this new covenant, this law that says, you know what, I can go to the foot of the cross. I can ask for God, ask God to forgive me. And that's a beautiful thing. It meant something to Paul. He said he had to die every day. I mean, think about that. I mean, unfortunately, and I hate saying this, most evenings I'm thinking, you know, if I'm working, I'm tired, I'm exhausted, I've been with teenagers all day, I'm thinking, you know, all I'm thinking about is eating and hitting the sack, right? Going to sleep. I'm going to tell you what, if I'm going to die every day, I need to get down on my hands and knees every night before I go to bed, and, and I just need to just pray to God and just, just cry out to him and ask him to forgive me if I've done anything wrong and do the same, repeat the same thing in the morning. That, God, I do what you want me to do this day. That's one of the New Year's resolutions that I'm going to try to do in the morning and in the night. I've I hope that's successful, that I can keep it going. Um, but that's one of the things that I'm going to do. It's just almost like a dying every day that Paul's t um, Paul talked about. Any questions or comments about that? Okay, so the righteousness of God is revealed. It's, uh, it's revealed by the gospel and the apostles. God's way of making men righteous requires what? And Wayne uh, it capped it off, faith in Christ Jesus. And we read that in verse 22. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe, for there is no difference. So the righteousness of God all starts off with faith. We must believe in him or what? If we don't believe in him, That's right. It's either all or nothing. If we don't believe in Him, we're going to die in our sins. It's that simple. So if you would, uh, go to John. Go to John chapter 8. John chapter 8, and if I'm not mistaken, it is verse 24, John 8, 24. Therefore, I said to you that you will die in your sins, for if you do not believe that I am he, you will die in in your sins. You've got a red letter edition Bible. This is Christ saying this. Is that not powerful? It all starts with the faith aspect. And and I'm I'm just, you know, I don't want to go into any of my personal tes testimony or things that I've been through, but I know being a believer, I've been through situations in my in my life where my faith has been tested. It's been raw. And I remember Colin telling me a long time ago, after I'd started preaching up at Melrose, he said, Mike, I'm going to tell you something. As you get older and you learn and you grow and you become more knowledgeable in the Word of God and you become a stronger Christian, your sermons are going to change a little bit. And I scratched my head. He, has this such, he had this such pro, just profound wisdom about him. And I thought to myself, how could that be? 
I mean, I know I don't know everything. And I went on these years preaching and getting a lot of, you know, success, baptizing, doing all these great things. And then I wake up one morning and find out my little grandson's got cancer and he's got 24 hours to live. And then six months later, my wife gets cancer and she's got a year to live. And I'm thinking to myself, wait a minute, I got to take a step back for a second. You know, something, something's not right here, okay? Something's not right. But I do know one thing, what Colin said was the truth because that was a game changer for me. It rocked my faith. God answered prayers. He's blessed us. We still have Candy and Caden, but I'm going to tell you something. Um, when you have your faith rocked like that and tested, you begin to kind of question things. And it's at that very moment in your life where you have to make a decision. Listen, I, I, I preached, I'm all in, I'm all in. I got to believe that. No matter how things, no matter how difficult life gets, no matter what I'm challenged with, I'm all in 100%. I cannot question anything in the Bible or question my faith. Well, I've got to be all in, and I've got to know that God, no matter how this thing works out, God's got his hand on it, and he's got his hand on me because I know for a fact that if I step back and throw everything away and totally give up and give up my faith and everything, and no matter how many sermons I preach, no matter how many people I baptized, no matter how many Bible classes I taught, if I take all of that and toss it right out the window, I know for a fact that what is said here is the truth. For if you do not believe that I am He, you will die in your sins. You will die in your sins. So I've got to be all in. I've got to tell myself, you know what? I don't care how bad this thing gets. I've got to keep the faith and keep moving on because I do not believe once saved, always saved. There's no scripture to back that up. Remember, I started off the week one and week two. Week one and week two. Book, chapter, verse. Silent where the Bible is silent. Speak where the Bible speaks. We have an argument. Produce the evidence. Produce the evidence. And it can be historical, or it can be forced conclusion, example from what God's word or, great, or uh, a uh, direct command. Produce the evidence, and I have it here. I will die in my sins. I have to be all in. I cannot let my faith rock at all. I know it's going to be tough, but you gotta, you got you to hang in there. Questions or comments? Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, let me. Yeah. But we do know this, right? Yeah. Yeah. And maybe that's the reason why the New Testament church started under the Roman Empire. It because it shows it shows us that there were people that held their faith no matter how bad it got. They stood the test of time. They didn't have it easy. Okay? That's exactly right. Go real quick if you would to John chapter 20. John chapter 20. And I'm going to read verses uh, 
I'm going to start at verse 28. John 20, 28. And Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord, my God, Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Think about that for a minute. We haven't seen Jesus. Think about the amount of faith that we have to be able to do that. Verse 30, and truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Think about that for a minute. It's either, it, we're either all in or not. Okay? Think about that. That's powerful. The way of salvation available to all who believe in Jesus. And we read this again in Romans 3, 22 through 23. It is not just faith that saves, but faith in Jesus Christ who died for our sins. And we know the key verse here that, we sh um, that I share with you at the beginning of the lesson tonight, offered freely by His grace, Romans 3, 24 and 25, through redemption in Jesus, His blood, the purchase price. If you would, go to Ephesians chapter 1. What I'm kind of doing tonight is kind of tying in some of the harmony of Paul's epistles with Romans. Kind of give us a better understanding of what's going on here. Ephesians 1, and I'm going to look at verses uh, 6 and 7. To the praise of the glory of His grace, by which He made us accepted in the Beloved, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. The riches of His grace. That's powerful stuff, the blood. And let me tell you something. I've got to think about no matter how tough life gets, and I've thought about this numerous times, and I had uh, one of the elders from Melrose had called me when I was at Shands, I think, uh, I think it was probably about the time that uh, Caden relapsed and had to have a bone marrow transplant. So he calls me and, he's, and he shared this scripture. He thought about this and said, hey, you know what? You think about that blood of Jesus, but you also think about Christ going on the cross. Christ suffered and died, and he bled on that cross for you. He suffered, and you think about that. And he said, you may have a loved one that's suffering. You may have, have someone, a, a friend or, or a close brother or sister, even a family member that's going through an extremely difficult time and they look like they're suffering. You just understand God's got it under control. He does. The, the thing that God would send his son to die on that cross is just... To, in the graphic images and the story and everything, the nail-scarred hands laying up on that thing. Let me tell you something. Horrible. But you, but you think about Jesus doing that because he loves us that much. He went to the cross out of obedience. And that wasn't done in vain. That was because he wills that all men be saved. And... You know, you think about the tragedy of a loved one suffering and that kind of thing, but you just think about this one. You think about what Christ did. Because you know what? This momentary life on this earth, we're just sojourners. Things can get even very ugly, like Brother Turner said. Things can get really bad, but you know what? we got a place prepared for us in heaven. That's where our citizenship is. Paul talked about that. It's not on this earth. We've got a place prepared for us in heaven where there's no pain, there's no suffering.
Any questions or comments? Okay, if you would, go to 1 Peter 1. Peter chapter 1, and I'm going to start at verse 18. Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without spot, without blemish, and without spot. Think about that for a minute. Christ didn't deserve anything that he did or anything that he went through, and he still went to that cross out of obedience. Think about that. Suffered and died. And Jesus offers as a propitiation, a sacrifice to appease God's wrath. Turn to 1 John, if you would, chapter 2. Now, Jared's covering this on Sunday morning. But uh, I'm going to tell you what, some of my favorite uh, books right here, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, I'm going to tell you what, this is powerful stuff. So 1st John, we'll take a look at uh, chapter 2. 1st John chapter 2, verse 2, And he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. Think about that. That's one of Paul's themes in the first uh, three chapters of Romans, that we've all sinned, but God's grace and blood covers everyone, not just the Jew, but the Gentile. God wills that all men be saved. And that's pretty powerful when you think about that, because later on in 1 John, he's talking about how we need to separate ourselves from the world and not be part of it. And that goes on to a whole different lesson. Go to uh, 1 John chapter 4. And verse 10. 1 John 4.10. And this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Think about that for a minute. God loved us so much that he did that. That's how much love he had for us, that he sent his son, who was without spot or blemish. That's love. And then later on, you know, John, um, you know, there's um, mention of how much love you would have for your brother. Would you lay your life down for your brother? You know, that kind of thing. That's, but this is ultimate love, that ultimate sacrifice. So demonstrating God's righteousness is in Romans 3, 25 through 26. He is just. Just is righteous. That's God. How could God be righteous when he had passed over sins previously committed? The blood of animals did not uh, truly remove sin. But he knew that Christ would one day bear the sins of the world. Hebrews 9 for me. Hebrews 9. Hebrews 9.15. 
And for this reason, he is the mediator of the new covenant by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant that those who are called, who are called, may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. That eternal inheritance. I didn't put that for a minute. So, I'm going to close with this. When I say eternal inheritance, what comes to your mind? When I just say eternal inheritance, yet never ending, a home, yeah, right. Okay. Yeah, so, hey, it's like this. It's forever. God's, God's prepared a place for us. It's a much better place. It's heaven. And you know what? Paul willed to go there, but he finally had to say, you know what? God, your will be done. Paul had a work to do. And we all do too. We don't know what's in store for tomorrow. We don't know what's in store for, the, for us this evening when we walk out those doors. But we do know one thing. Hold steady your faith. Keep the faith. No matter what happens in this life, do not don't do not allow it to rock you. You hold steady and know that God is under control. And what's the worst thing that could happen? Nothing. Because you know what? If you lose your life, God's prepared a place for you. That's what we got to think. That's what we have to focus our minds on every day. What am I going to do to make God proud? What am I going to do to please God? God sent his son, but I need to give my best every single day. Hey, the victory's already there. We've already won the battle. We just have to carry the torch and keep the faith. Amen? All right, any closing comments? All right, it's uh, just a tad bit past quarter till. All right, if you would, Romans chapter 4 next week.